I've been obsessing over this bit of family history lately, and a friend referred this place to me as a community that loves the mysterious and potentially supernatural, so I think you'll find this interesting. First, a history lesson. My great-grandfather and his brother were privates in the 5th Battalion of the King's Own Royal Lancaster Regiment in the First World War. Now one of the lesser discussed contributions to the war effort was the General Post Office pulling off possibly the greatest feat of postal infrastructure that had yet been witnessed in history, transmitting literally millions of letters back and forth between the front lines daily, mail carriers from the REPS delving into hell and back time and time again just to make their appointed rounds. They're often made fun of in the modern internet era, but the truth is, couriers have pretty much been hardcore badasses forming the backbone for all of human history. Unfortunately, censorship was tight. Officers opened and checked every single one of their men's letters, not just to check for confidential war information, but also to make sure they weren't saying anything that contradicted the war propaganda or constituted a threat to public morale. Basically, unless you acted like the front lines were as peachy as a summer camp, your letter was liable to go right into the bin. My great-grandfather apparently tried to send many letters, but few made it through. It was likely officers of his own unit confiscated most of them, so they were probably left to rot in some trench. But he did one day feel either brave or desperate enough to try to sneak one by in what they called an honor envelope or green envelope. These were special and infrequently allotted envelopes which were, supposedly, delivered without censorship, so long as the sender vowed to mention only personal matters under threat of harsh punishments. Unlike regular correspondence, only a tiny fraction of green envelopes were opened up and combed over by staff back at base. Unfortunately, this letter was one of those terribly unlucky ones. Most confiscated letters were just destroyed. In many cases, their senders were given no notice their mail had even been withheld, although the lack of a reply usually made it obvious. After the war effort was over, many surviving confiscated letters were given over to archives for the education of future generations, and a few others even found their way, at long last, to their original intended recipient, if they were still alive to receive it. That is how my great-great-grandmother came to finally be delivered the last letter he ever sent, many years after his death. My family hoped that it would maybe comfort her, offer her some closure over the deaths of her sons which she never seemed to quite recover from. Instead, whatever was in that letter only mortified her, and she claimed to have had it burned. She passed away from heart complications not too long after. My grandmother said it was a bittersweet day. Sad as it was to see her go, she'd lived a long, long life, and they were sure she was overjoyed to finally rejoin her husband and sons in the ever after. Imagine our surprise, though, when my mother dug up the original letter tucked away in a drawer of scattered documents while cleaning out the attic of the old family estate. The old iron gall ink was so faded over the years, we had to visit a photographer's shop just to be able to carefully piece together the full letter under their UV light setup. We expected some sentimental goodbyes, some waxing philosophical about the insanity of war, you know, the usual. We couldn't have been more wrong. My family's been bandying about possible explanations for the letter for years now. Most agree that it was probably a dream, or maybe some sort of hypnagogic hallucination brought on by the stress of combat. Another theory is that he'd made it all up entirely as some sort of artistic statement. He had been a published author before the war, after all, and his purple prose seems implausible for someone describing a mind-shattering trauma. Still, nothing makes complete sense to me. He must have had some notion these may be his last words, a final opportunity to relay what happened to his brother and say goodbye to his mother. Would he really waste them on something that wasn't true? No matter how many times I read over my grandfather's words, it always makes me wonder. Perhaps he really did see something down there in those blood-soaked trenches. I'll let you judge for yourself.
To my mother, Henry died yesterday. My mind quivers with the memory of those leaden volleys bursting through his chest like a needle pierces a vein. The blood's faded, now, but I can still feel the little red droplets, like they're still warm upon my cheeks. I wish I could tell you he cried out your name in the last, but in truth, he was simply gone. Extinguished in the instant of a muzzle flash, existence having clawed its way, baying and writhing, up from oblivion, to taste from the waters of life for a trifling moment before being once more consumed by those deep black seas of nothingness. That was all I could see before the gas flooded the trenches once more, and I could only flee, wailing, past the twisted bodies of my countrymen as the gas consumed them, red veins bulging thickly over jaundiced flesh like strings pulled taut over a violin, figures fading, twisting, peeling, bulging, faces wide-eyed, open-mouthed, but silent. I wish I could tell you that these horrors shook me to my core, but I have become inoculated to them to an extent that frightens even myself. The war proceeds like a blurred and abstract haze around me, each day indistinguishable from the next, dispensing its horrors like a machine, unthinking, unfeeling in its destruction of life. Though he was my brother, his loss failed to shake me, and his name died out on my lips just like it did my countrymen's. Indeed, the true horror did not set in upon his death, but rather upon his return. It was during the twilight hours beneath the waning moon that I alone sat alert, watching the moonlight dance a waltz with the wisps of fog, like spiny gray fingers stretching up from the turgid soil, when my eye caught a glimpse of movement from one of the piles of bodies littering the no man's land, beyond the trenches. Words cannot express the horror that assailed me when I beheld my own brother crawling from the charred pile with an inhuman lurch. His jaw was slack, clinging to his pale face by scarlet strings of tendons, his eyes swirling with an implacable, cloudy mist of white, emptied of feeling as he limped obstinately through the battle-scarred fields, even as his pierced chest oozed a black ichor. For too long, this campaign has left me sleepwalking through life, without passion, yet this sight was a grand exigency, lifting me to my feet as if stirring me from some terrible trance. I followed, creeping through the trenches, peering up over the battlements, not daring to make the faintest sound as I observed the grim procession of the thing which was once our dear Henry. The battlefield was more quiet than it had ever been, not a sound audible over the gentle weaving of the wind through the branches of trees, until at last my ears picked up the faintest traces of music. My mind recoiled, picking apart the sound, as if unable to accept it as anything more than a flight of fantasy, but the tune persisted, draped over the battlefield like a warm blanket, filling my heart with terror and awe in equal measures, until, at last, I reached the very border of the trenches, and had followed Henry as far as I was able. I peered up at him a final time, and my hand is quivering now, as if it's committing some mortal sin just by immortalizing this blasphemous sight in ink. There was some uncountable legion of them, their forms nebulous and abstract as they darted in and out of the swelling fog. There were Russians and Germans and Austrians all in communion, and some were more ancient still, man-at-arms from ever more distant and primitive times. Across time and nationality, all were united in the primeval dance of war, whooping and wailing as they cavorted across the battlefield, pale flesh clinging to brittle bones. Henry, or what remained of him, locked arms with the promenade of the dead as if they were old friends, his face twisted into some noiseless caricature of laughter. My mind struggled most of all to comprehend the ever more monstrous silhouette they danced around in undying supplication, their twisted bodies connected to the great beast with scarlet strings. It was a cyclopean creature, a thousand faces bulging from its malformed flesh, their features blackened by shadow. Said flesh had been torn through in scattered patches, revealing only a burning, undying fire raging in its hollow belly, from which the faint cacophony of battle could be heard and in its many hands, it clutched the instruments of war, from glittering swords and rotting firearms all the way down to the bloodied stone that had felled Abel some eons ago. I watched as if spellbound, unable to so much as breathe as their waltz unfolded before me, until at last their dancing slowed and the entity unhinged its rapacious maw. Two by two, the young men goose-stepped into the behemoth's jaws, driven by some unholy sense of duty to allow their existences to be snuffed out without feeling, without ceremony, their names never again to be uttered by a human soul. 
It was at that moment I awoke in the trenches as if roused from some grand and terrible dream. But no dream could match the vividness of what I beheld beneath that callous moon. I do not know why I write this. I know these letters never reach you, mother. Perhaps I write this out of some vain hope to relieve myself of being alone in what I had witnessed in those final moments. As, just moments before stepping into that darkened maw, Henry turned and let his pearly eyes meet with mine, raising a rotted finger, and he beckoned to me with a twisted smile not formed of malice, but of love. It was at that moment that I knew I would never again see your face, never again soak in the fragrance of your cooking and the chirping of wood pigeons in the cabin I had once called home. If you ever read this, I am so sorry, dearest mother. But the morning your children stepped into these boiling trenches, war already had us clutched in her pallid hand, dangling us above the fire for but a few futile moments until it was time for us to join her in her immortal dance. With love, J.H., my grandfather didn't survive long enough to be court-martialed for trying to sneak this letter by. He went MIA while fighting in the Second Battle of Ypres before his letter even reached London. His body was never recovered, but his name is still immortalized on the Menin Gate Memorial to the Missing. May we all pray that the world is never racked by another war of such a scale again. 